Okay, so um, so we're currently on week, uh, what is this, week eight? Right? This is six, seven, yeah, this is week eight. So we're basically at the middle of the semester. Uh, we have this week and then next week and then spring break, right? And then after that, we're just going to wrap up the semester. So uh, the plan, the schedule, if you look at the schedule here, Share this screen here. And so we're going to take a look at the schedule for the course. So we are actually in pretty good shape, right? So we spent the, the first few weeks of the semester uh, before the exam just looking at vector space, the vector space model in general, right? And we looked at distance metric based algorithms. So, uh, you know, uh, KNN. Um, Singular valid decomposition. Then the these three weeks we've been spending time on probabilistic methods, right? So if you if you remember, I introduced Bayes theorem last week. That's extremely important. You can expect that to be on the exam, for instance. And I went over all of naive Bayes, right? And Bayes theorem. And then, as I said, the next topic, which is the topic that I'm covering today, is called hidden Markov model. Um, and this one also is built on top of Bayes theorem. Right, but you already hopefully have a good understanding of of, of Bayes theorem <coughs> in IE Bayes because you've looked at these two videos and attended the class, and you and we went over the code, right? So that code was still doable by hand. Okay, uh, the what we're covering this week, uh, hidden Markov models, is built on top of naive Bayes, but it it's it's a little bit more complex. Okay, so it, it, it uses an algorithm called the Viterbi algorithm. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the Viterbi algorithm. Have you guys ever heard of something called dynamic programming? Nope. All right, dynamic programming. So these are like slightly, not super hard, right? Not super hard. They're just algorithms that are, you know, uh, innovative. Um, actually, the person who invented, so let me make sure. The person who invented uh, the Viterbi algorithm is somebody called Viterbi. You know, it's, it's a very significant algorithm for something called dynamic programming, which is basically a technique that solves a problem in pieces. So it creates a lookup table, like a table, and then it just says, okay, I need to solve all these pieces. And so the algorithm solves these pieces, then stores the, res the result in a table, and then it brings all that together. Make sense? So that's what it is. I'm, so I'm not, even though I have the code, I've, you know, I've got the code for you and is written from scratch. Uh, we're not going to go over that code, okay, in detail. Instead, you're just going to use it, right? So you can use it to solve problems, but we're not, you know, I, I'm not going to spend because, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit high level. But if you feel like you want to look at it, it's totally accessible, okay? It's accessible. The point is it needs a lot of time. If you thought naive base took time last week, this is even more, right? So it's a little bit more involved. So we'll go over that. So the plan for this week is, you know, I've already laid the foundation for Bayes theorem, right? Last week. So I don't really need to repeat a lot of that. You know, it, it builds on top of what we looked at last week. So today I'll lecture um, hidden mark of models. And I got my notes here. Um, so, um, you know, you, you know, and then we'll have the video and everything. You'll see it's pretty, pretty similar ideas. Um, and so we should be able, and I'll give you the code. The code is already on uh, GitHub. So we'll just download it, play with it. It All it needs is NumPy again. So if you notice, this class has that theme of NumPy. Uh, so we'll cover that today. And then as I had said before last week, my plan is just to give you Wednesday to work on the recommender system, right? And I assume you guys have started working on that. Yes. Okay. Good. Uh huh. You want to add? So what do you mean? So do you want them to look at some things and then recommend something for yeah. that person? Is that what you want? Yeah. yeah. I want you to do that. Actually. And you're using different data. Yeah. Anime? Yeah. 
so it recommends anime shows or yeah. cartoons or something like that. Okay. Yeah, good. So yeah, so that's why, you know, this is an important homework assignment. So I'm just gonna, we're gonna take Wednesday just to do that. So, but please bring your code ready. Or if you wanna just use the, you know, the movie reviews also and, and you know, play with that, but you know, try to have something right by Wednesday so that it's more useful. Um, so that's the plan. And then uh, next week, reinforcement learning. Okay, that's a, to me, that's a, like a beautiful topic, right? I love reinforcement learning. It's just fascinating. Uh, so I'll go over that, the lecture, and then we'll go over the code as well. I'll, I'll provide the code for you. Um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll talk quite a bit about uh, reinforcement learning next week. Then we'll have spring break. And then after that, probably the topic that you've been waiting for all semester, I hope, neural networks, right? So we'll go over um, the history of it. So if you can see, should be about five weeks of it, including uh, TensorFlow, which is a, you know, this, you know, state of the art, state of the art for big data and everything. So we'll look at the Keras framework, which is uh, the, the, the easiest, if you will, to implement this, okay? So, so that, uh, that's how I'll wrap up the semester as I usually do uh, with neural networks. Uh, but we still need to finish up, as I said, hidden markup models. I probably, I've always thought even to my, you know, the, the hardest topics in this class, honestly, are singular value decomposition and then the probabilistic methods, right? And so, especially the coding part of it. And so um, that's why I'm not really like expecting you to code this. I've given you the code, certainly for the naive base, for the base one, probabilistic. I don't expect you to, I just want you to understand the algorithm, right? Understand the differences, et cetera. But I, I like to provide code from scratch whenever, you know, I, I like to make sure I understand things. So uh, yeah, so that's the idea. So today then, hidden Markov models, this should be pretty interesting uh, and fun, I think. I, I've always found this very uh, you know, fascinating. So this is, uh, so let's start then, I guess we can begin. Uh, I'm not hearing any questions from anyone, right? No questions. No questions, guys? Nope. All right, great. So. Let's talk about hidden Markov model, okay? So if you notice, the sequence that I have followed for probabilistic method, so probabilistic ML, right? And probabilities, we've already described it, I'm not gonna repeat it, but we basically talked about phase theory. Right? And you have that equation about conditional probabilities, and you know, we've gone into a lot of detail about it. Now, if you remember, what we were trying to do before was to predict um, you know, probability of a document or a probability of you know, some data belonging to a class, right? But the thing is, we looked at, let's say, the IRIS data set, right? We grab a sample of IRIS data set. You guys remember it's got F1, F2. F3, F4, but to calculate this, we have to grab the probability of F1 times the probability of F2 times the probability, oops, probability of F3 times the probability of F4. And these are the conditional probabilities, right? And then it's it, and then we would do like some math tricks to change multiplications into sums of logs, right? The log of probabilities. But disregard that. That's more of a, you know, this is called numerical methods where you take, you know, a technique and kind of find an optimal one. But if we think just of the intuition of it, basically we had sequences of probabilities, right? And you were trying to make a computation. We usually had, we want to select class one, class two. So then we do, you know, this calculation several times and we pick the highest. You guys remember that? So that's basically what we did with naive base. As it turns out, we can use that similar idea for, the, for other types of problems, okay? And in this case, the type of problem that we're gonna tackle now is 
a, a different kind of machine learning problem. So before with Iris, what are we doing? I take this sample right now. So I take a snapshot in time, right? So now time becomes really important, right? So time is the thing that I'm actually throwing in as new here, right? So whereas naive Bayes, time was always one snapshot in time. I grab a, 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 an input, F1, 2, F3, F4, all four features at the same time, at the same T equals whatever in time. And then based on that, I predict the time, right? Now we're gonna take a different approach where time is gonna change. So now we're gonna have sequences of time events, basically. So what that means is I'm gonna represent this as a sequence of events that are depending, dependent on the previous one. That's a very new thing, right? And so if you think about this, this is called sequence uh, machine learning or sequential machine learning, right? What that means is I'm going to predict this state and then given this state, I'm gonna predict the next state. And then given the previous two states, I'm gonna predict this third state. And then given all of the previous ones, I predict the other. You guys see that? This is the kind of problem that we're predicting. So, so when would this be useful? So let's, let's imagine, let's start with that. So an example, how many of you have heard of something called the Fitbit? You've heard of it? What is the Fitbit? Who can tell me? Yeah. yeah, right? Over time, right? Over, over a year, right? And so it's tracking you today and tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. Well, that information, is useful to the Fitbit company. They're collecting that sequentially because they want to predict, you know, well, what have you been doing? What did you do last week? Just eat snacks and, and play video games, right? <laughs> and so your Fitbit recorded that every day, right? And so what, what do you think the company is going to say? Well, maybe recommend a piece of lettuce, right? <laughs> and remind you that the sun is out more, yeah. go outside, that kind of thing. If you're an athletic person, Right, you know, and you 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 know you ride your bike or whatever every day. The Fitbit is also tracking that, correct? And so then what they might say something else, like they might recommend drink more water, you know, and remind you of of things that are happening. It may also correlate with weather, right? So it may see that you like to go out when the temperature is a certain above a certain threshold, right? And so that's that's like the states, right? And that's why uh, the, the technique that we're going to uh, talk about is called hidden Markov models. In particular, the word hidden is important because there's some hidden information that allows you to infer other information. For instance, in the example of riding your bicycle, they might correlate that with the weather, right? So like the weather is sunny, rainy, cloudy, sunny. So it's gonna maybe learn about the weather and then be able to predict what you're gonna do. So obviously, you know, you probably like to go out when it's sunny, but maybe not. Maybe you're one of those people that actually just wants to go out when it's cloudy because you you know you don't want to uh, you know you don't like the sun for whatever, <laughs> right? And so uh, if if it's uh, cloudy, that might be the day. The thing the the point is, it would learn that it would learn the sequence, right? How likely are you to go out uh, riding your bike, especially if it was rainy today, rainy tomorrow, then cloudy? So might, you might be like really hoping to go out and ride your bike, right? And so at that point, they might, you know, show you an advertisement or something like that based on, on that information. You guys see that? This is the kind of problem that we are talking about today. And that's why this is called sequence machine learning or sequential machine learning, okay? And I'll just show you the, we'll, we'll do the, you know, the logic, the theory of it, and then we'll play with the algorithmic code. We'll just post it on, on, on GitHub, and then you'll be able to see, you could model other problems uh, with that. Because, you know, you don't necessarily have to, you can just use the Viterbi algorithm without having to write it every time, right? It's, it's just an algorithm. So, so that's really the idea, okay? So what I want you to understand is that before we had one state 
and we would predict a class. It was one snapshot in time. Now we have to take into account t, t plus one, t plus two, t plus three, okay? Time is important and, and all of this depends on, you know, all of this depends on time basically. So, all right, so that's um, the idea, okay? So this is, so this, the technique, now there, are, so sequential machine learning uh, can be addressed by several techniques, all right? So uh, there's, there's uh, sequence, basically. We have data as a sequence. Another classic example of sequential problem is uh, in natural language processing, right? Sentences. The, uh, the cat is sleeping. So if I say the cat is sleeping on, what would you say? The cat is sleeping on the bed. You're not gonna say on the river, right? Because that wouldn't make sense, right? And so the point is that in, in, in language, based on context, based on all the previous words, we can infer the next one with a certain degree of probability. But it's the same kind of thing for other, you know, just any problem that you can think of that is sequential, you could model it through this. Now, traditionally, the classic algorithm for sequence mining has been hidden Markov model. More modern versions uh, of this since about uh, 2012 is probably the uh, RNNs, which are called recurrent neural networks. Uh, these are uh, a, a, a neural net type of a technique. However, the way that in this uh, area works, this field, is that they are now, at least according to some people, extinct. And they were replaced by something called the transformer, which is another technique I'm very modern, only about five years old, from 2017. That's when it was put together, this algorithm. And it also captures sequence, especially in, in natural language processing. It has been used extensively, but intuitively, you might consider it for other problems as well. So, you know, sequential problems, why not, right? There is that. However, to, you know, transformers is certainly the most complicated algorithm in machine learning. Without a doubt, you know it's it's most complex and also the most uh, data intensive. So this is not something that we're going to cover in this course. This is actually a, a graduate level type of a thing. But uh, we are going to start with the hidden Markov model, okay? Which is the classic and very powerful. Still, I I want you to understand that just because I say things like "Ooh, transformers are great in 2017," that doesn't mean that a hidden Markov model is obsolete, right? Not every problem needs a machine gun, right? You know, some things can require just a, you know, hidden Markov models can be very good still. That's what I want you to understand. And at the end of the day, a lot of these things are very related. I mean, it, you know, the, the, the things that make them different are like, you know, they add a new thing, but they, every, all ideas build on, on everything else. So anyway, so we're going to talk, so hopefully this makes sense. So we're talking about sequential machine learning. And so the hidden Markov model, so this, yeah, unfortunately for this one, I don't know why I didn't have notes for this. So I had to create them again, but, but um, yeah, so that was strange. Remind me, I, I have a way of saving these as PDFs, what I'm writing here. So please, before the end of class, remind me to save it. And then that way you can have the notes, okay? Because uh, these are my only notes for this. Okay, so hidden Markov models, okay? All right, so that's the topic that Markov is, what, you know, the person that came up with some idea uh, and then oh, oh, oh good. So, so let's start talking a little bit about hidden Markov models. And, and basically to start with hidden Markov models, we actually have to start with a concept in computing called the automaton. Have you guys heard of the automaton in any of your classes? No? Uh, have you guys heard of the state machine? A state machine? So in computing, a lot of things are basically state machines, right? And what that means, uh, so it's automaton is something that tr traditionally for modeling, 
is we're modeling of sequences. Okay, and basically here, uh, an automaton, we can draw it over here, is a state machine. And what that means, the state machine is, is basically like a model of specific logic that has movement, right? Has a, a specific movement uh, in the algorithm. So here, for instance, you know, usually you have something called a state. You have the beginning state because it has to begin at some point. And then the state machine will move to another state. Some states, you can be in them and continue to be in them in a loop for a while, right? And then after that, you might go to another state and eventually you're gonna go to an ending state, right? So these are automatons, uh, state machines, okay? So, so they're, they're used extensively to model things in computers. So let us model actually an entire language, right? So we're gonna use the automaton to model, so let us model, let us model an entire language. And you'll, hopefully this will make sense. Um, so this is a classic example from natural language processing. Um, so we're gonna model an entire language. So should we start with the English language? Probably not, right? So let's let's kind of model something a little bit easier than the English language. Uh, with a state machine, and how about we model the sheep language? So what's the sheep language sound like? Sheep, what do they sound like? <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> right, exactly, very good. So so what are some of the words in that language? Bah, <laughs> right. What about bah, right? And then there might be even another one, bah, right? And, and so on, right? So, so it kind of has that, that's kind of the language. So how do we use an automaton to model this? Well, think about it. It's got a beginning state, which seems to be, we're simplifying it, starts with a B, right? That's the state. Then from B, what does it usually go to? E, all right. How many E's can you have after the B? At more than one at least, right? Yes. Two, three, or more. Bah, a very angry sheep, right? So, <laughs> so then here, you model it like that. You see that? And then you go to the next state, which, you know, that's, it. that's all you need, right? To model any sequence of this, that's all you need. And then you go to the next one, which is H. And this one also can be sequence, right? And then the ending state. And then here you, you can have a beginning state. And that's it, uh, that's it. Believe it or not, we just used an automaton or a state machine to model an entire language. It's gonna be a very interface. And with that little expression, we can actually model the entire thing. You, you guys see that? So that's the whole point. And this is sequential, right? So it goes from one state, remember these are states, and then they're making the transitions. Now the question is, what is the probability that you know, it's gonna be like this? That's what you wanna figure out, right? You have some characteristics and you wanna predict, is it gonna be bad or bad or you know, whatever it is? Well, you use this machine and probabilities to figure that out, got it? And that's just a simple example that we can use here. Obviously, uh, you know, this gets a little bit more complex or well, not complex, but uh, bigger. And we're gonna build this on, you can see how this is starting to look like naive age, right? Already, you know, where we were doing language. So now we go over here and, you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to do sequence prediction. Okay, so we're trying to do sequence prediction. So let's think of another example now, a little bit more involved, like with the English language. So we have the, Cat, dot, dot, dot. All right, so there's another problem in, uh, in, uh, in lateral language processing called POS, part of speech tagging. There's another one called NER, N-E-R, named entity recognition. 
So in named entity recognition, what do you want to uh, recognize? You want to find the entity, right? So what's the entity here? Cat, right? So usually then you would say O, and then you would say here uh, entity. So this could be, you know, entity. And then this would be O for out of, out of you know, not an entity. In part of speech tagging, you're gonna basically the things that you learn, you know, in our grammar school, right? So you're gonna say, oh, the is a determiner, all right? And then cat could be a noun, and then eats could be a verb, but also uh, cat could be, so let's say another possibility. So this is, uh, let's say A, option A, option B, this could be a determiner. This for whatever reason could be an adjective, this could be um, the noun itself. So if you think, well, if I see the, it could, it could be the cat eats or it could be the tabby cat eats, right? So, so you, don't, you just don't know, but you're trying to figure out what's the correct, given this input, what is the predicted sequence for it? Is it this one or is it this one? So you guys are already trained language understanding machines, right? You understand language. So which one of these is it? More, it well, I should say actually that the, way, the correct way is which one of these two is the most likely sequence for this input? A, right, exactly, A. You see that? How do you know that? Okay, you know that, and how do you know that? How did you learn that? Do you think you went to school and what did you do in school? Studied and studied meant what? Learning and probably just reading things a lot. You read a lot of things. And every time that you saw a cat, it said it was a noun. And then you were like four when you saw that. And then five, when you were five, you saw that again. And eventually you're like, yeah, I've seen this like three times because you don't need that much, right? You see it a couple of times or a teacher tells you once and you, that's enough. You remember it, right? But basically you're calculating the probabilities yourself. Think of a language that you've never seen before. You know, I don't know what, some language, right? And you're reading it. Well, you don't understand anything, but as you start seeing patterns, you're going to see, oh, I've seen this character before. And I see this character at the beginning and, you know, and so eventually you start to see like, like you're doing a count of how many times you've seen something and then it starts to become like important. You guys see that? So, so we are kind of doing the same thing as humans. We're calculating these probabilities in some way. You guys see that? So, so that's basically the idea. So, um, so the idea then is we want to write this as a probability, right? So then I can do this. Sorry, Ron. Okay, and so now uh, we're going to say that we're going to write this as a probability. And so, what's how do you? Well, we're so then you say to yourself, well, what do what why do I use this probability? Well, how about what you learned last week? Right, just use Bayes' theorem, conditional probabilities. All right, so you're going to say. If I'm going to use a conditional probability, then that means I'm going to say, well, the probability of DT noun verb given the cat uh, eats. Is and then you estimate that value, right? This is exactly where, what we were doing last week, right? If you remember, we, the only difference is last week, we were giving it the whole document, which was a huge sequence of words, and we were only predicting one class. Here, we're actually giving it shorter sequences because it's now just sentences, but we're not just predicting one class, we're actually predicting a sequence of classes. Well, you, you can think of it that way because these are classes, right? If you're if you're predicting DT noun verb, you know, there are there's like 30 of them, right? So so there's like 30 of them. If you're predicting entities, 
usually the standard approach is like none. You know, is it, is it a company? Is it a person? Is it, you know, those kinds of things. All right, so basically it's still, it's still kind of the same thing, except that now you have more class, you have more classes here. You have more classes here. And this is actually the same sequence of words, basically, uh, except that now it's shorter. And they match. They usually match, actually. You think about it, one, one for one. OK? And so, so it's very interesting how that works. And for the other one, we can also compute the, the, like we talked about. So now I want the probability. Well, here's another option, DT, adjective, noun, given the cat eats. You see, so basically, same input, because we're trying to figure out which one of these two is the correct one. Right? How do we calculate this? Very much like we did last week with Bayes' theorem. We just need the probabilities of these. Okay? And you, as you will see later, uh, as, I, as I usually do, so I, I show an example with natural language processing, but then another one. We'll do another one just based on the weather, right? like the Fitbit example I talked about. So now you would compute. So now you need to figure out how to compute this, which you probably have a, 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 an idea already. But just keep in mind, once you get a probability, let's say 0, 3, and then this probability is 0, 8. Well, actually, this one is the more likely one, right? So if, if our data is correct, like if we have, and for this, we need a lot of data, right? So this should be like 0.13, right? Because then we would pick the probability that's the highest, right? So that would be that. You guys understand? And then that's, that's it. So the modeling that we're trying to do is we give it this input and it, we want to select this sequence. So we compute the probabilities for all possibilities, all possibilities. Now think in, in the English language, that's a lot, right? And that's why that Viterbi algorithm comes in, which as I said, we're not going to get into Viterbi, but just be aware that's the technique that makes this solvable. Uh, so we have to pick, so now select, the highest, select the highest probability. Okay. And that's, that's it. That's literally it. You guys understand? Are there any questions? Very similar to naive base, right? Very similar. Just a slight variation, but extremely uh, powerful. So now let's take a look at just, uh, so how do we solve this? We solve uh, sequence. Sometimes this is also called sequence mining from data mining, so sequence mining, uh, sequential machine learning. There's a lot of you know, classifications, but this is important. Um, reinforcement learning is a type of se sequential also. That's why I kind of have re reinforcement learning after this one because it talks about states and things like that, but it's not probabilistic per se, but, or at least based on Bayes' theorem, but so much, but um, yeah. Anyway, how we solve sequence mining with Bayes' theorem. So we're gonna solve it with Bayes' theorem. And you can see again, we come back to the same idea. Uh, so now we, what was Bayes' theorem? The probability of Y given X, right? And I should say the probability of X given Y, right? Is the probability of Y given X times the probability of X divided by the probability of Y. You guys remember this? That's the equation that we learned last week and it's exactly the same. Okay, so hopefully the intuition makes sense. So we need this, we need Bayes' theorem. Now remember, we end up, let's see if you guys were paying attention last week. Um, after we do two simplifications, after two simplifications, or let's say actually, well, there's two, but let's say after one simplification for now, after one simplification, we end up 
with words. So this is a, a question I like to ask on the exam. So pay attention to this one. So I like to give you this. So I usually give you, here's Bayes' theorem, and then I'll say literally, after one simpl simplification, we end up with this. Please uh, kind of derive this. You know, give me the, the reason why this is true. Or how is it that we can go from this equation to this one? Therefore, you know, what is the simplification and why? So you guys have to tell me, and, and we covered this last week. So, so what is it? What's the difference? Notice. PYX, PX, it's the same. So all I've done is I took out the denominator. Why is that? Why, you know, I, I gave the proof for this last week. This is, this is a exam. It's a common denominator, exactly, exactly. So we learned last week with Bayes' theorem that PY is a common denominator, as you said, so it wouldn't change anything, right? So they're all gonna be the same plus four. So whether it's 0.5 or 4.5, it doesn't change the outcome. And so that, that's exactly right, very good. So we don't take probability of the whole, um, we don't need the denominator and we simplify, right? So that's why uh, I'm kind of, um, you know, I don't want to repeat what we covered in, in class, but just last week, but just remember, we, we, we can get rid of the denominator, but it's because, as you said, it's the common denominator for all sequences. So it's almost like if we look at over here, right, they would all have divided by A, divided by A, so therefore we can get rid of it. Oops. Okay, so now... So anyway, so we have arrived after one simplification from last week, we know that we end up with this equation here. We also learn the second simplification still applies here. So the second simplification applies here. So if you remember, and I, and I want to hear a, a stress, this. go back to the example, right? So we have the cat eats, right? So we want really this, right? So I'm going to take one of these probability DT noun verb, the cat eats. Okay, so we have probability DT noun uh, verb, the cat The problem with this is the following. It, the cat eats, that phrase seems very trivial, right? You, 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 we see it and we think, yeah, it's pretty trivial. But how many times do you really think that this sequence appears in all of the text that has ever been written in English? And I mean everything, like the Wall Street Journal, classic stories, everything Google has. How many times do you think that phrase will appear? Quite a bit. Okay. A billion. Okay, good. I like that. So a billion. What about the phrase, the spaceship enters the black hole? How many? Huh? Not as often. Not as often. The pink spaceship enters the black hole even less, probably just that one time, right? And that's exactly the point I'm trying to make is that although it seems like these phrases would be very off, very common, and they might be a billion, not all phrases are. And usually in language, it's gonna be a lot of unique phrases actually that provide a lot of insight. And so the problem would take, it, the problem with this input here, giving it this whole input, is that getting the probabilities for this could be very challenging, very, very on, you know, very difficult to get this. Because here is this sent this, this uh, trigram as it's called, because there's three, but 
it, it can become very difficult. Basically, we might end up with a situation where we can't find probability fractures. So a simplification to this is the one that we did last week, where we said, you know what? We don't actually need to find the probabilities for the whole phrase. And instead, we find the individual probabilities for the, cat, and eats. Just a separate word. So now compare. How many times do you think you see the word cat versus how many times do you see the word, the phrase, the cat? Which one will have a more likely likelihood of occurrence in the text? Just the word cat, just the word cat, right? So the simplification is that it's difficult to get probabilities for phrases, right? But it's easier to get probabilities for individual words. You see that? So again, intuitively, we covered this last week. And just, I want you to understand that that's the simplification we're gonna make, the same, the same one. So, and the same applies to this one over here. Right, we don't need to get all the, pro imagine now you need all the probabilities of whenever you saw the cat eats, that it was also determiner now and verb. So it becomes a bit more challenging, right? And so, so the, simplif the second simplification, remember, is we don't need, so the second simplification is we don't need, uh, or we don't take, let's say, the probability of the whole sequence. Okay, and this is exactly what we did last week. Nothing has changed, nothing has changed, but instead uh, break it into the parts. All right, so, so what, this, what this means is that we're gonna treat this as, instead of treating it like this, so let's say, so instead of probability of x1, x2, x3, and getting that probability, remember, we just break it up into probability of x1 times the probability of x2 times the probability of x3. And this is really important because, as I said, getting those probabilities could be very difficult in our text. Keep in, keep in mind, I said the entire English language and everything written, and you said a billion. Do you now, now let's say you're a company. Do you think you would have all the text in the world? No, right? So that billion that he gave is actually, in, in practical terms, would be a lot less. Because you know, you wouldn't even have 10% of all the text that has ever been written, right? It's very, even Google, I don't think, has, they're probably the ones that have the most text of anyone, and they probably don't have even a 10% of, of it, you know? So, because think about it, there's the whole, there's the whole dark web, and they have a lot of text, and maybe Google can't get in there. There's all the classified stuff, probably can't get in there, right? I don't know. So, there's all, also, there's all the stuff you guys have written on your computers, that's still English language text. Maybe, I don't know, Lenny is writing an, a novel, right? <laughs> and we, we don't have access to that. You, you see what I'm saying? So it's not, you can't have all, right? So, so that's my, my point. There. So anyway, you, do you guys understand this one? It's the same simplification from last week. Okay, it hasn't changed. All right, so, all right, so that's it. That's it as far as like last week, right? And kind of tying it back. Now let's get on to hidden Markov models. Uh, and we're gonna apply to a, a problem. Uh, so let's, the best way to understand this is probably just to do an example. So this is the same example uh, of, the, of, the, of the code. Uh, I didn't write a Jupyter notebook for this one. So it's only Python, a Python script, right? Uh, you guys can convert it into a Jupyter notebook if you'd like, uh, but the code should run. So uh, let's do an example. We're gonna go back to that Fitbit uh, scenario, all right? So Fitbit, uh, imagine you're all wearing a Fitbit and it's tracking you some, somehow. So then we need to define our state machine, hidden Markov model machine. So we're gonna have basically, the, one of the keywords is states, okay? So the states can be, and remember it's hidden, 
there's a hidden layer, hidden Markov layer. So there's going to be a layer we're going to call an observation layer, which is the thing that you see. And then there's the hidden layer, which is the thing that you try to infer. So for instance, we were talking about the weather and exercise, right? Or, or go ride your bike or, or what you do that day, right? So, so that's really the idea. So the states are going to be, and these are the observed states. So the, the states are going to be rainy and sunny. Okay, those are the states that we can observe, right? Today's sunny. I could add cloudy, but the, the problem is it's just going to make the example more convoluted. So I'm trying to keep it a little bit simple. And then these are the states and then that you observe, or, or these are the states, sorry. And then there's going to be the observations. Okay, observation. And basically what we're trying to learn is a type of a mapping between them, okay? So we're going to have, uh, as far as the observations, we're going to have three options. You can walk, you can shop, or you can clean. So basically, these are the activities that you would do that day, right? You know, walk, shop, or clean. And they're going to be dependent upon the weather. Another classic uh, variant of this is you have the weather and then consumption of ice cream, right? So that day you consume ice, you, you have ice cream or you don't have ice cream, right? So, but this one is a little bit more interesting, I think. So, so let's take a look. Now the observation, remember, the observation is a sequence. So what that means is that you see this sequentially. So let's say that today you walk and then tomorrow you shop and then the next day you clean. And then finally, the next day, you walk again. Okay, these are the state, the, the observation is the things that you can do. So let's just say kind of to frame this a little bit better, that today is Monday, then Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, right? So these are your activities sequentially. So now, given this, you want to predict the weather, right? For instance, so... So what would be the, the logical thing since you guys have already trained hidden mark of models in your head, you can figure this out, right? Some, some kind of a something that's uh, similar to that. So what, what would be the sequence? Remember, what are the states? Give me the, the sequence of states given this observation, the sequence of observations. Sunny, okay, good. Oh, let me change color here. Okay, so sunny. What about the next one? Rainy. Okay, good. What about the next one? Rainy as well. Yep. Sunny. Very good. Exactly. Exactly. You see that because you, you find the correlation between the observations and the states. Okay. And that's exactly what we, so you guys were able to do this easily, right? You looked at it, you have a lot of context in the world, but at the end of the day, that context is probability. Again, when you were four years old, you probably wanted to go play, but it was raining, you still wanted to go play. Then you got really wet and decided, you know what, next time I'm not gonna go play. Right, you learn. And so, but you learn these probabilities, same thing here, but now you're teaching a machine to do that specific task that you, didn't, you don't even know how you can do, but you do automatically without any problem. So this is what hidden Markov models do in, in the simplest sense. We are trying to write, uh, uh, develop a technique and algorithm that can actually do this for us, okay? And so we're gonna you know, uh, see, see that. So here then we infer, so we infer a sequential, a sequential model. Okay, so here now we need to state it just like we stated it before for the language problem, right? This, we stated that for the language problem. Now we're going to state this for the, for this problem, but still as a sequence. And then if we can model it as a sequence, then we can apply uh, Bayes theorem. So we can say here, well, one option is, we look at the previous one, 
right? So walk, shock, clean, walk. And then what is it? Sunny, rainy, rainy, sunny. So given walk, shop, clean, walk, what is the probability that it is rainy, sunny, sunny, rainy? That's exactly what we're modeling. However, this is only one option. Another option is the probability that walk, shop, clean, walk, but it could be, I mean, it's possible that it could be sunny, rainy, rainy, sunny, right? It's not correct because the, uh, the, the statistics, the, the probabilities that we're going to compute are not going to select this. But that is certainly an option, right? You know, we could have said, for instance, sunny, sunny, rainy, sunny, right? It's possible less likely probably right because if it you, you if it's if it's rainy you shop but you know so that could have been uh but you can also shop when it's sunny of course all right so that's the thing so now here we do the exact same thing as we did before we need to compute this which we've all we already know how to do it right um and here we're gonna get zero zero three let's say and this one is gonna be point um, zero, 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 seven. And then which one was it? Oh, it's actually sunny, rainy, rainy, sunny. So the bottom one should be the, should be reflected by our data, right? So then once again, we pick the highest one and that's the correct one because the probability of doing computing this will be the highest probability. Got it? Same tricks as before, the log of the sum of the sum of the logs of the probabilities, all that still applies. Uh, but the you know the intuition is is almost exactly the same. You just have to think about the algorithm, like you the formulation of the equation is almost the exact same thing. You just have to think about the logic a little bit. But as I said, I've given you the code, so uh, we don't need to worry about that. So we we need conditional probabilities here. So now we need, so how does now, now we, we come to the point where we want to solve this, right? So to solve this, to solve this, uh, we need the probabilities. Okay, so to solve this, we need the probabilities. In fact, we're going to need, we need three tables. Okay, so we're going to need three tables. And uh, this is kind of now getting into the specifics of uh, the uh, solving the algorithm itself. Did you, do you guys remember how many tables we needed in the previous one? We needed to compute some, some tables, right? Do you guys remember? In, in Naive Bayes, we, we calculated some data. And then in this problem, we also calculate some data about the probabilities, the relations of things. So the, the three tables that we need are one called a transition probability. So transition probabilities. Then we have another one called the emission probabilities. And then we have the final one called a start probability. Okay, so we just need this information. If we have that information, we can plug it into our, our hidden Markov model. So for instance, in the code that I've given you, I give you the three tables with data, and then I give you the algorithm. If you have any other problem, right, any other problem, then you could just change the data and run it through the algorithm. You guys see that? So, so it's, it's basically like that. So we have these, and then basically we need, so we're going back to the state machine, right? So what that means is that we have the beginning, and that's like saying, what is the probability that we would start here, right? So for instance, we have to, so the classic example, it is uh, almost March. What's the probability that it's sunny versus the probability that it is rainy right now in March? 
higher chance of sunny. So we have some disagreement. All right, let's pick June. What's the probability that it's sunny versus rainy? Much higher, Much higher sunny. How did you get that? How do you, how do you know? You've experienced it a lot. So you have several samples in there where in, in June, you had 15 examples that it was sunny and five that it was rainy. So you concluded sunny. You see that? It's exactly what we do here, right? In the algorithm, literally. So exactly. So you start here, you calculate some kind of probability, let's call it zero. And then we're gonna transition into this other state, right? As, you know, you know, and so here we have another probability P1, for instance, maybe this is P2. What is P2? Think of P2 as, you know, a current probability plus P1. And then you can think of P1 as a current probability here, at, you know, at time, right? So this is like time two, and this is time one, let's say, and plus probability of P0, the previous one. You see that? So like this one feeds into here and then P1 now feeds into the next one and so on. You see it, it's accumulating. Just like we have done in Naive Base, it's kind of the same idea. Okay. All right. Um, so the question is, how do we get the probabilities? You know, well, we just discussed that, you know, as I said, you know, you, you've, you experienced it, as you said, you've experienced it throughout life. So you have this certainty, you know, um, about things. So that's our, you know, when we're taking a new task, right? Let's say that you're learning how to drive or something on the interstate, you haven't experienced it. So you don't have any information as time passes and you drive on the interstate, what happens? You you kind of learn probabilities of this and that, you know, and then you you can do things, right? So so the the trick is um, how do we get the probabilities? We need to have we need to have some data, a corpus of data or or something, and then we calculate the frequencies of things from that data. So the transition probability table. So transition probs, right? That's gonna be from rainy to rainy or rainy to sunny, et cetera. So this is the states. So it's basically state to state. Okay, so that's the, the type of table there. Then we have the emissions probability. And this is more like the conditional one. So this is gonna be, for instance, if rainy, then shock. You see that it's that the conditional there. If sunny, then clean. We need to learn these probabilities. We're going to have them in a table, and then we'll be able to compute. Okay, we'll be able to compute. So now, so we want to solve the problem, right? Of which one do we pick? So we're going to we're going to then uh, formulate this with Bayes' theorem. So we're going to do P of A, B, yeah, yeah, no P. What is the probability of A given B? which is probability of B given A times the probability of A divided by probability of B. Remember, we can get rid of B, right? And so this translates basically into probability of RSSR given WSCW. So remember, this is walk, shop, clean walk, rainy, sunny, sunny. That's what we want to do. And we do this for several things. So we do, um, um, we do the simplification as, as we had talked about before. 
Uh, so now if we write this like this, right, then that means that on this side of the equation, it should be probability of walk, shop, clean walk, given rainy, sunny, sunny, rainy, right? Because we're, you know, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, and times the probability of rainy, sunny, sunny. And then we're just going to compute this for all possible scenarios. So the other option would be, so this is option one, this is option two. The other one would be the same probability of walk, shop, clean walk, given S, R, R, S, probability of S, R, R, S, right, and so on. So we, calc we, we need to compute all of these. And as you can see, this can get, can be quite a bit, right? And that's why this, is, this, this part we're not gonna get into, but this is in the code. There's a function you will see there called the Viterbi algorithm, which is what allows us to do this computation, okay? And, but I'm gonna leave that as outside of the scope. Now we need to do a, a one last simplification, which is really to, rewrite, to make these independent. So we're gonna rewrite this. So let me just um, write it out over here. I'm gonna take just one scenario. Probability of walk, shop, clean walk, given rainy, sunny, sunny, rainy, times probability of rainy, sunny, sunny, rainy. We're, we need to rewrite this so that we break this up, right? Because we're not gonna have probabilities for the whole sequences. We only have probabilities for the individual ones, right? So now we can rewrite this as probability of walk given rainy. Notice what I'm doing. Oops. Notice what I'm doing here. So I'm just taking these two. What is the probability of walk given rainy, right? Which makes sense. Times the probability. Let me be consistent. Times the probability of rainy. Okay, so that's. Right, so I'm just grabbing like this, this and that, and I'm separating them out in the algorithm. Then I have, once that's calculated, right, that's kind of that state, what's the probability of walking given raining, given that it was raining, right? And then I do the next one, probability of S given S times the probability of S. So now I'm just taking this one, this one, and that. I'm breaking it up into parts, okay? So that I have the individual probabilities. This thing that I'm doing, this is done by the algorithm also. So I'm not gonna explain how this is done in the code, right? Because that's in the code itself, but just understand the logic of it, right? So that, that kinda, this is how we're breaking it up. And then here then we have probability of shop or uh, clean, sorry, given sunny, times the probability of sunny. So that's this one, this one, and this one, right, together. And finally, the probability of walk given rainy, given probability of rainy. So that's this one, this one, and that. All right, and so we've now gone from this one, which is not tractable basically as a problem, to this one, which is very much solvable. You guys see that just by breaking it up into the individual ones. And, and really all, all you have to think is, I don't need to know that it, even though it's a four day problem, I don't need to know that it was rainy, sunny, sunny, rainy to infer walk, shop, clean, walk all at once. Instead, I can, all I need is to know on Monday, right? It was, what's the, prob the conditional probability that, that you would walk given rain given that it was rain, right? So basically, because remember, just the probability of rain, you have to treat as a separate thing, right? It's just rain. And then you also think the probability now, the conditional one, that given that it's raining, you would walk. You see that? And then the, the, the next day then, you would say now the next day is, 
Well, I want to predict that I that it's uh, that I would shop given that it's sunny together, and then for that day that it's sunny, right, and so on. So you do you compute the sequence of preferred days, and then you predict the most likely one. But you have to compute all of those. Remember, this is just one. You could have other. You would have all the variants here. Like here, you would have probability of S given R, probability of C given R, probability of W given R, right? And all of those are going to be individual ones. And then you just pick of all the combinations the one that has the highest likelihood for that sequence. Is that clear, guys? Does that make sense? Just to pick that. So you pick one, okay? And so now that we have that, um, we can basically think of the problem with the data. So here we have states. We've got rainy, sunny, and then we've got the observations. which are walk, shop, clean, walk. All right, so that's what we saw for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, right? Now we need the probability. So here we have the start probability. So that's going to be then a little table which contains our data. So we need to know for the states, rainy and sunny. So rainy might be 0.6, sunny might be 0.4. So if you live in Seattle, for instance, this is probably the probability is there. You see that? That's the first table that you need. This is for the starting state, right? Then after that, you need the transition probabilities table. And this is, even if you didn't understand the algorithm or something, this is what you definitely need to do to use the code, right? Because I, I could give you another problem, right? I could give you a problem, you know, that I want you to figure out what's a good sequence problem. Predicting, I mean, anything, right? Predicting um, travel, route. yeah, travel, right? Exactly. Let's, I was thinking of kind of the same thing. You have some birds, right? And you have some like lakes and you want to predict which, which lake are they going more, more likely to stop at, right? So, you know, they got this lake, this lake, lake, lake. So you have a sequence of them. And then the hidden state could be the wind, could be the weather itself, right? And then you just want to predict that sequence. So Whatever it is, the problem, as abstract as, as it could be, you just have to find these probabilities and try to model it. So, you know, lake, lake, you know, land, land, fly, fly, something like that, right? Would could be the or or the or the you're trying to predict actually, you know, if you have a sequence of stops, right? Like lakes, you you want to know do they do they land or do they continue flying? You know, so it could be like fly, fly, land, fly, fly, land given some observation like wind high, wind low, wind high, wind, you know, something like that. So as you can think of any problem that you want, once you figure out what the states would be, what the observations are, then you just need to find these three tables and you can use hidden mark of models. Does that make sense? All right, so that's what I want you to understand. So you need to start probabilities first for the states, rainy and sunny. So in, in the case of the birds, it would be what? High wind, low wind, right? Let's just say high wind, low wind. So what is the probability of low wind? Probably 20%, high wind, 80% or something, right? You just got to get that big. Now you do, you need to figure out the transition probabilities. And these are basically the transitions from one state to another. So for instance, if, what is the, oh, let me, So this should actually be three rows. So the transition probability is transitions from states. 
So you go from rainy to rainy or rainy to sunny, or you go from sunny to rainy or sunny. So what's the probability that it's rainy and you go to rainy, 0.7? What's the probability that it's rainy and you go to sunny, 0.3? What's the probability that you go from sunny to rainy, 0.4? What is the probability that it's sunny and the next day is sunny, 0.6? You see that you have, obviously, how do you get these from the real world? Right. Whatever your problem is, you know, you need some data of the birds or some data of the transport that you're an analyzing, whatever it is. Right. You know, think of Ukraine right right now, the whole war. You know, you could model this, you know, what's the expected action of the attacker, right? This day, that day, that day. So so you can do the same. Does this make sense, guys? So any problem you could potentially solve it like this. You just have to think in terms of, I understand this problem now. What is it that I'm trying to predict? Is it going to be perfect? No, obviously not. The world is very complex, but sometimes your models can be good enough. You see that? So, so that's really my point. And then the last table is called the emissions probability. And this is usually what, you know, the conditional, one, right? Which is also data that you can get because we simplified it by treating things independently. So now this one, uh, the emissions probability, it's got three rows, right? And it'll have four columns. Okay, so here, what is the, prob the probability of walk, shop, or clean given that it is rainy or it is sunny, right? So what's the probability that you walk given that it's rainy? 0.1, probably lower, right? What's the probability that you shop given that is rainy? 0.4. What is the probability that you clean given that it's rainy? 0.5. Now, what's the probability that you walk given that it's sunny? 0.6. What is the probability that you shop given that it's sunny? 0.3. What is the probability that you clean given that it's sunny? This data is collected because you have a Fitbit or a year, all of you volunteer to have a Fitbit and then they, they, they kind of track you. You kind of every day press a button, did you shop today? Did you, clean? you know, something like that. But so that's basically the idea. Got it? Any questions? Is making sense? So as I said, if you want to solve any problem with a hidden Markov model, well, it would make sense that it should be a sequential problem, right? And then all you need to do is in this slide, okay? In this slide, figure out what the states are, figure out what the observations are, and then get these three tables, from the real world somehow, and then boom, you can solve it. That's it. It is that simple. And then we can treat really, as I said, the algorithm, I won't get into the dynamics of it because it is a, um, it, it uses like dynamic programming, the Viterbi algorithms, several things, and it can be very involved. So now that's basically it as far as my notes. So I wanna save this as a PDF. Um, I believe, and I'll post this on Brightspace. But anyway, I guess the next thing I'm going to do now is just switch over to the code. So are there any questions about any of this? All right, so this, as I said, this one last slide is literally it, okay? That's all you need to um, solve your problem. So now let's, let me save this somehow. Yeah, PDF. I believe it's this one. This is HMM notes. 
let me stop sharing here just so I can do this. Okay, and I'm going to upload that file on Brightspace. Okay, that's not. Yeah, so under this one, hidden mark of models. This should have, yeah, this has the notes. But for whatever reason, I lost this. Mm -mm. Notes. Okay. And then, all right, so there it is now. So you can just basically everything that you know what we covered today. That's actually exactly the copy of my notes. Uh, and there it is. So you can see here this is the whole discussion today. And really, like I said, the most important thing is any problem that you want to do, you just need this and the script that I provided. Or, or get home. So now let's let's go ahead go ahead and do that. I'm gonna close out of here. So we need to go. Oh, let me share the screen. Let me share here. All right. So now um, we need to go to. Click on this hidden mark of models. This is the script basically, and it's this one out of the Kirby. <coughs> right, so I'm really just gonna copy paste here. You don't even need the data because the, the data is really just made up of the probabilities, right? You don't need a data set here. Obviously, you would need that. You would need a data set to compute those tables, but that's a different thing. So I'm gonna just copy it, and then I'm gonna start a Jupyter notebook. Okay, so you guys should be seeing the Jupyter notebook. So I'm gonna go to desktop. 365 and create a new one. All right, and here I just paste the code. There it is. Let's just tweak it a little bit. Um, so just so that it runs, it should run, I think. All right, so let, let's try running it. And there it is, it ran fine. And so uh, I'll go over the code in a sec, but basically what's happening here is I give it this input, walk shock, clean walk, and it predicts that the most likely sequence for walk shock, clean walk is sunny, rainy, rainy, sunny. What do you guys think about that? Does it seem reasonable? Yeah. Okay. And that's it. That's literally it. So that's the that's the algorithm. Everything in between is like print statements of how it computes things, like the like the dynamic processing of the data, etc. But like I said, we're going to treat those things as a black box. So now let's think a little bit of like if you were going to use this, right? And I usually would assign you a homework, but because I want you to work on that uh, recommender system, I'm not assigning homework. But if you want to play with this, but what I would say is think of another problem, right? Like some sequence that you're trying to predict, change the probabilities. You can actually just do that based. So think about this scenario. 
you already have in your brain the data, right? Think, you know, you know, like, well, if birds stop at a lake, they're probably not going to stop at the next lake if they're only like five miles apart, right? Because they already have water, so they might wait until the next lake. So you can actually fill in that data yourself just because of your own knowledge. But the way it works is pretty straightforward. You can see this is, uh, at the heart of it is the Viterbi algorithm. It only uses NumPy, right? NumPy here. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Okay. Um, so it uses NumPy. So notice exactly like in the slides, we gave it the states and then we give it the observation. So walk, shop, clean walk. Okay. Uh, but I can, you can give it other observations. You can see here that I have a few other ones. So what if it's shop, walk, walk, clean? What is it going to give us? Or what if it's clean, clean walk? You know, what is it going to give us, right? So we're going to try this in a second. But as you can see, this is kind of the input that you give it. Then you have the state, the start probabilities, as I mentioned, the transition probabilities. Just notice these are dictionaries, but basically a table. And then you have the emission probability right, exactly as we discussed in the slides. Then after that, it's only, is the code. So this is just the logic, you know, this is uh, the print, the data, and then, then here's the famous Viterbi algorithm, okay? So a university named like their school after Viterbi. So he, his algorithm is pretty good. And you can see it's here, but kind of, as I said, I, I, I want to avoid, it's a little bit, involved so we can, we're just going to use it as a black box and um and then that's it that's that's the code the whole viterbi algorithm does it very elegantly um and so now you have a program that you can use you have basically what you have here is a simple implementation of hidden markov models uh to solve sequential machine learning Obviously, if you wanted to increase the number of states, the number of observations, you would have to go in into the code and change it a little bit. Um, but although we are going to try in a sec, I'm going to try a longer sequence. See if it all, you know, if it if it'll support a longer sequence. You guys understand what I'm saying? All right, I think it does actually. Now that it does. Any questions? Clear. All right, so let's try then. Uh, another another one, right? So I'm going to try shop, walk, walk, clean. Okay, so shop, walk, walk, clean gives us sunny, 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 rainy. Shop, walk, walk. Oh, that seems reasonable, right? Don't you think? Seems correct. Now I can also do clean, clean, or clean, clean, clean walk. Let's see what it gives us. See, it looks correct too. Clean, clean walk, clean, clean, clean walk gives us rainy, rainy, rainy sun. So it works. Let's try now. Let's try a longer sequence. That I don't know if I've tested before, but why not? let's try it. So is there one in particular you'd like to try? Or no? Well, let's, let's just say walk, that's easy one. So clean, 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 walk. Uh, yeah, walk. Right. One more shop. Like I said, I don't know if it'll. Yeah, I, I just I don't know if I when I did this, I didn't test for like seven states. So I don't know if it'll break, but but we would have to change the code. Obviously, if we change the code, you know, it should work. But let's let's see if it works. So clean, clean, walk, walk, walk shops. So let's see if it. Oh, yeah, it did. So good. So what did it say? So clean, 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 walk, 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 shop. So it should be rainy, 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 
sunny, 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 and then who knows what the last thing will be. Probably sunny, I would say. Let's see what it says. Rainy, 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 sunny, 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 sunny. See, this algorithm thinks like me, <laughs> right? So at least for this one problem, a machine can do my, my job, right? And so, um, and there you go. You've been able to solve, you can now solve certain types of problems that are sequential in nature. You know, very simple. Look at the code. It's not that long. I mean, it's, the Viterbi algorithm is extremely clever, but it's complex. But look at how that's it. And it can do, you know, a lot of things that are sequential in nature. Where Remember, it's predicting labels, but now it's predicting labels that are dependent on previous labels. You guys see that? And although it's not perfect, Look at how many simplifications we did to it. And yet I saw clean, 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 walk, 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 shop and concluded something. It concluded the exact same thing. So that's one of the things, one of the takeaways from machine learning is that machine learning sometimes you have so many simplifications that you think would break down the thing. And it remarkably does very well. So either our intelligence that we are so proud of is really not that amazing as we think, or, or I don't know, but um, you know, it, it's, it's very interesting how that works. And that's very common and actually in, in a lot of machine learning, very simple things do very amazing things sometimes. So that's it. I mean, you know, that's, uh, that's all I have literally. That's, that's the notes for hidden Markov models. Uh, you have the code. So, so you have now a new tool for a new family of problems. Remember, these are built on the naive base classifier that we learned last week. You already knew how to do that one. You have the code, I, I think. Um, you have Weka also where you've implemented that. Weka does not do hidden Markov models. Uh, so this is actually, if you want to do hidden Markov models, this is the black box that you would use. Right. And then I've, I've like, like I said, I've, given you. Now, what I might do on the exam is I might give you a problem like this, but obviously not with, um, not with, yeah, with this, like clean and walk, it'll be a different thing. I'm not going to ask you to compute it by hand, obviously. That's nuts. <laughs> huh? The, the problem would be, yeah, it would be something like understanding something. Um, because implementing Viterbi by hand is even worse. <laughs> so that's crazy. I wish I, there's a very nice graph of Viterbi, but I, I didn't bring it. Um, I don't have it with me, but um, it's, it's, it's pretty complex. It's, it, you'd have to study Viterbi itself and dynamic programming. But anyway, that's it. So hopefully this, you have the code now. Um, if I think of a homework, I'll, I'll, I'll provide it. You could do your turn. Also, we should start talking about the term project at this point in the semester um, of what you want to do. You have enough now, right? Remember, you're doing the homework right now, recommender system. Please, if you came in late, remember on Wednesday, we're done with hidden Markov models. I'm not going to, this is it. So uh, on Wednesday, I'm going to ask you guys to just work on the recommender system in class and you know, uh, ask for help basically, but I would like you to demo whatever it is that you have so far, okay? Um, because I, I'm probably gonna make it do like next week, okay? So this would be your last, I just wanna see where you are. Next week, I'll do uh, reinforcement learning. We'll, we'll wrap up basically our, uh, that for spring break. And then after that, as I said, uh, neural net, deep learning, all that, all that stuff. And, uh, but I want you to start at this point in the semester, we're like in the middle of the semester right now, week eight, you need to start thinking about the term project. Okay, uh, probably groups of two at most, uh, start thinking, you might wanna do sequential, you know, just do this. Um, or it could be supervised learning, like a classification problem. And we are gonna cover neural nets, which is also classification. So even if you start with naive base and KNN for your problem, by, you know, in, in three, four weeks, you'd be doing neural nets. Yeah. 
Yes, exactly. I want you to find a problem. But like I said, if you pick a sequential problem, you'd have to attack it with this. So right now, the tool set that you have is basically classification problems, right? You take a picture of cats and dogs and you have to say it's a cat or a dog, right? Or you take some data, tabular data like iris, and you predict Satosa, Virginica versus color. So that, that's all you could do. Now you can do sequential things as well, hopefully. And then the reinforcement learning, what we're covering next week, I wouldn't recommend doing that for a project given that reinforcement learning could be a whole course, right? The whole semester course. And I'm only gonna cover it one week. Uh, so probably not that. And then as I said, the topics that we're covering next after spring break are gonna be also supervised learning. So you have pictures of cats and dogs, is it a cat or a dog? Except that the algorithms that we're gonna use now are not KNN or naive Bayes, but they're much more powerful. And in particular, they can learn better and they can handle way more data. That's the, that's the key thing. We're still gonna use CPUs here in the class. Our machine, our computers should still be able to process TensorFlow and Keras, but just like NumPy, they're optimized to be fast. Remember what I said about for loops, right? That they're bad, right? And TensorFlow is exactly like NumPy in that. You guys did the NumPy exercises, right? At the beginning of the semester. So TensorFlow is like that, only in a different language. It was developed by Google. And so, and there's also PyTorch, which is Facebook's. I actually like PyTorch better. Um, and then there's one more technique called unsupervised learning, which is when you don't have labels. Oh, I forgot, you also know how to do singular value decomposition, but that's why you have the recommender system here. And that's it. So start thinking about the project. You know, as I said, find something that is interesting to you and then decide um, what you're gonna do. But this Wednesday, recommender systems, and we're gonna hope for that homework will be due the Wednesday before spring break, hopefully. Questions? Anything? Any questions? All right, that's all I have for today. So we can stop here. Stop the recording.